Talking financial organization and a professional practice does not have to be boring. Are you ready for a few money in, money out ideas? It's Susan Gunn coming directly to your head to make you think. Can you handle the truth? Because she is known for being energetic, laughs a lot, and gives honest, sometimes direct, but always practical advice. It's time now for Money In, Money Out. Like many others, I was sad to hear the news about Larry King dying from COVID complications. What an amazing storyteller he was. And I looked up to him. It did not surprise me to learn that he very rarely prepared for an interview. He knew how to ask questions and sit back and listen. His interviews were just two people hanging out together, having a conversation. Sometimes that conversation got a little dicey. Sometimes that conversation made the other people completely uncomfortable. Sometimes it put the guest on the spot. But he had a gift of pulling up news headlines, inviting a guest with the expertise related to the headline, and he'd ask away. He was so truly gifted and had such a very unique interview style. He liked short, direct, and uncomplicated questions, which he believed provided the greatest answers. Yeah, I got to tell you, I'm just not comfortable with that style yet. And if you could see how many notes I took for today, you would know that I like research the heck out of it because I want to be sure I know what I'm talking about, I guess. Maybe eventually I'll get to a Larry King style because I really liked that. I mean, so why not do that? But today is different. You know, maybe the next one. Um, but someday, but until then, I'll be the research queen. To that end, today's topic has been completely researched by myself and my guest, Janice Jansen, as we bring you another episode in the Embezzlement News Story, ripped from the headlines in 2012. Welcome back to the table, Janice. Thanks, Susan. I'm happy to be here. Oh, yeah, this is our favorite topic. As a certified fraud examiner, we love talking about embezzlement. And boy, we really both kind of, we've so far today have spoke about an hour and a half just about this case and all the different intricacies about it and had caught up with each other over the last week and a half as we've been reading and watching things. And uh, it's it's intriguing. I'm real excited about talking about this ta- case too. And so let me introduce to you Rita Crundwell of Dixon, Illinois. This was uh, actually a hint from uh, Linda Valencia to uh, cover this, just to let you know, Janice, I don't think I ever told you that. Linda told us. There's a shout out to Linda. She was, on, she was on an original podcast, and uh, she said, oh, you and Janice need to cover this one. And I so I had, read, <laughs> yeah, I had read about it, too. Our uh, fraud magazine, I think, covered an um, article about it. And so I was pretty excited to tackle it. Rita grew up in Dixon, Illinois. She's homegrown, high school educated, worked herself up in the city government, started there uh, in high school to the city comptroller's office. She was married for 12 years, then divorced before the embezzlement began. That's especially important to note. Um, And so there was some similarities between the Fruitcake Company embezzlement in Corsicana, Texas, and the Dixon, Illinois city embezzlement case that's astonishing. And it has so many twists and turns. If you've not listened to the um, uh, Corsicana uh, Collins Street Bakery embezzlement podcast that I did with Teresa Duncan, then you need to listen to that because that one's still one of my favorites, maybe not after today, but still one of my favorites. But both were small towns, Corsicana, Texas, and Dixon, Illinois. Both were completely entrusted individuals. Both frauds went on for years in the millions of dollars. And we both know that the longer it goes, the larger the embezzlement amount, right? Exactly. So both should have been caught in a 
variety of so many different ways um, over the length of time that it happened. And just a particular note, Dixon, Illinois is the boyhood home of Ronald Reagan. I thought that was an interesting note. I, I like that information as well. Yeah, I know that they're probably trying to hang on that a little bit with the bad press that they've gotten because of Rita, but um, there were so many similarity. In fact, Dixon, Illinois' population is 16,000, and Corsicana's is 23,000. And and I'll say that probably the difference in the population has a lot to do because the um, fruitcake company, College Street Bakery, is a large employer in Corsicana, Texas. So uh, this was the city. And now Dixon, Illinois, unfortunately, is now known for being the largest municipal fraud in U.S. history. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And if fraud of this magnitude can happen in Dixon, guess what? It can happen anywhere, and it does. Small towns where everybody knows everybody. It happens. People start talking, trying to figure out where all her money came from. And they all assumed it came from showing horses. But let's talk about the play. I've told you a little bit about Rita. Janice, tell us about the other players. Well, you know, I found this one, this interesting. This, it, Kathy Swanson was the, um, the lady that actually was the whistleblower on this. And uh, she, she had worked with Rita for years and years. So she was, she she was upset with herself that she didn't find it first you know she hadn't found it earlier but um she I, I can't remember how long she had been there but i think she had worked with her for about 20 years yeah she was the deputy treasurer yeah 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 so and kathy you know got all of her information from rita or if she needed to figure something out she went to rita um just so happened on this occasion that when she found the fraud that uh, she had to get the information from the bank accounts herself and was rushed and just said, give me all the accounts. Usually what she said was that Rita told her to give her the account numbers, give them the account numbers and they'll send you the documents. Well, this time she just said, give me all the accounts and uh, Got she more than what she bargained for. <laughs> yeah, she sure did. Poor lady, she had a, a rough time. Yeah, I felt really bad for Kathy. Yeah, me too. Then we also had Mayor Mayor James Burke. Uh, he was the mayor at the time, and he's the one that Kathy went to. And um, and because she, she didn't know who to go to. She didn't know who to tell or anything. She went to the mayor, and then he's the one that went to the FBI and started that investigation rolling. So those are the major players in this whole whole thing. Well, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about a couple of others um, as we get into the the what she did. Right. But one of the things was is is that we were so astonished about is that their budget had to be cut and so many services and payroll had to be cut, not because they were short any money because of all the money that she was stealing. That's right. So, I mean, in fact, she would come in. One of the one of the things that I read said that she would in uh, put cartoons on financial reports that she presented that showed the bleeding of money. Or I read that too. I was like, oh, yeah, oh the cow yeah. being broken. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was very visual have needed to trim money kind of thing and so i just thought that was that, that was something I, didn't do that. I know susan i read that they um that the city of dixon had to take out loans uh in pretty much the amount that she had stolen there were a few years that she stole five million dollars for that year and they had to take out loans for that exact amount wow yeah wow while trimming their budget yeah. Sad. So let's talk about what she did. How did she do it? So she made herself the loan signatory of all city checks. So there was no signing of the double checks, which I understand they've changed. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. 
that she was the loan signatory of all the city checks. Then she moved money from five of the fifth third bank accounts, the city bank accounts, there were five, into a sixth bank account. And those were all city bank accounts, known city bank accounts. Um, so for the budget purposes. So, you know, the police from from part of this went for the police and part of this went for the fire. Part of this went into a sixth bank account. Then she created a seventh municipal bank account called RSCDA that nobody knew about. Mm -hmm. That was the surprise uh, that Kathy got when she asked for those bank statements that day. Right. There were not six bank statements that Kathy knew about through the years, that there were seven bank accounts. And when she saw that, she was like, uh, don't know what's happened. In that seventh bank account, she paid all her personal expenses. Right. So that's what Kathy saw in the bank statement that there were personal expenses being paid. So how did she get money to that seventh bank account? Well, she created fake invoices for fake projects. And for instance, they showed in something that we were watching. Um, was it the, it was the waste department, wasn't it? A waste department invoice that was created that normally has a logo in the upper right. left-hand corner. And she created fake invoices um, without a without a logo. Right. And it was the same supposed company. But so the ultimate is she created 179 fake invoices over this period of time, transferring payments for those fake invoices into the seventh municipal bank account that nobody knew about. Right. No one knew about. She began in 1991 with 181,000. Okay, seriously, Janice and I have been doing this for a long time. And we said, good God almighty. <laughs> she started lot. with a $181,000 theft. Yeah. It's not Where's usually you start with $100, you know? <laughs> yeah, 20. I mean, 20. About 181000 to start with? Yeah, oh, my crazy. gosh. Ours usually start with, you know, padding the payroll. Right, you know, right. And then they'll wait a week or two. And then they, they look to see they'll take cash from a uh, from a uh, patient payment. But 181000 right off the bat? Good gosh. That was crazy. <laughs> I know. So that was 1991. In 1992... She stole $302,368. Okay, let's leap up 16 years because this happened over 20 years. She stole in 2008, during the Depression, it's one of the points that several things that I read uh, made a point of, that there was a recession going on. And so the city thought that it was just a bad time. In 2008, and that's one of the years I think you were talking about that they took a loan. Yeah. Um, she stole $5,637,546. But wait, the next year she sold $5,599,247. But wait, in 2010, she stole $5,637,832. Really? I know. A year. It's a thing. A year. So then she was finally arrested in 2012. And, and you said that last year, she still, in the six months between this discovery, right. and when the mayor had the FBI come, she stole right. how much? Uh, it was either 1.1 1 .1 or $1.5 million dollars in that six month period. Cause Kathy was like, it was making me sick knowing that she was still stealing that money and there wasn't anything she could do about it. Cause she was waiting on the FBI. Yeah. I just, I can't imagine being put in that spot. Me either. Yeah, I just, you know, 
and she couldn't she didn't couldn't say anything to anybody no she couldn't tell kathy couldn't tell her boyfriend she couldn't tell and her boyfriend said why what's going on why are you okay was really concerned about her for six right. months right and so um that's stressful it is it the, is stressful the total amount of the embezzlement Fifty three million seven hundred and forty thousand three hundred and ninety four dollars. Let me repeat that just in case you missed a zero. Fifty three million seven hundred and forty thousand three hundred and ninety four dollars. Holy crap. It just this makes you sick, doesn't it? Yeah. So how much was the lottery winner this weekend? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that was a little bit bigger, I think, than this, but holy moly. And I, one of the things that I read said it was $3,313.50 per resident. But she's wow. And essentially, that's what she did. She that's stole right. from the residents of Dixon. That's right. Yep. So I, I thought it was really funny, too, that she kept uh, the FBI did a search when the FBI came and talked to her at the mayor's office that day and arrested her, they executed search warrants for her, her houses, for the ranch, for, did I say that very Texan? Ranch? <laughs> oh my God. I did, didn't I? I'm sorry. I try to keep that out of the podcast. It's just, it is who I am and it is not going away. Um, Maybe it was just the association of ranch and Texas. Maybe that was it. I'll go with maybe, that. Maybe. That was, um, but they executed warrants and they found uh, records, financial records of her fraud in the basement of her house. Isn't that interesting? You know, I thought that was very interesting because you would think you wouldn't want to keep any record of it. Right. But she had it all. Well, and you'd be surprised how many times we find records. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of them keeping keeping a track of how much they've been stealing somewhere in the desk. Yeah, yeah, under the keyboard. Right. But in the desk drawers, the $1.1 million. But anyways, um, interesting to know. Let's talk about the other players now, because I, I got to tell you, just like I have had issues with some CPA firms in my um, embezzlement cases, not catching obvious signs of, and it's not their job, in all fairness, right. it's not their job to detect fraud. Should they ignore warning signs? No. But it is not their job to detect fraud. Therefore, it's not on the forefront of what they're thinking. And if they've been dealing with the people, then they don't think anything's going to happen. And I think that's what happened to this audit firm. I agree. Tell me a little bit about the audit firm, because I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I found it interesting that they had worked with the city for so long. And like you said, Susan, I think it was just the trust. Again, it's that small town mentality, you know, not that we don't have that exact same thing in the dental offices that we work with and that, you know, there's always that trust, but I think they trusted her and that the information that she was getting to them was correct. Um, but I found it interesting that they, the company, um, created their, the financial statements for the city as well as did the auditing. So that I found interesting, you know, yeah. there was, it was not a separation of duties anywhere, not, at all. Really, not in the city or in the auditing uh, company. And then um, the other thing I found interesting was that they were also responsible for Rita Crunwell's, uh, her horses and her ranch and all of that stuff. They, they had the city and her company. Um, they were do doing audits for both. I found that very interesting. Yeah, a huge conflict of interest. In fact, I've, I've had a few calls, uh, phone calls in the last couple of years where um, associate dentists have the same CPA as the primary dentist. And I've, I've said that's probably not in your best interest 
right you probably get a different cpa and they don't understand why i would make that recommendation but this is one of those reasons you yeah. know they they you they think they see i mean in a different way but you still need a separation of those responsibilities and an auditing firm is not supposed to prepare financial statements. Right. That That's way, what I'm yeah, it's way outside their scope of work. Yeah. So yeah, that was really interesting. Um, and so that one of the, one of the things that I've often said is if people suspect fraud, they probably shouldn't have their CPA look into it. Yeah, might be. Yeah. Depends on where it's coming from, right? Yeah. Well, it'd be the $1.1 million uh, CPA that I spoke with. Um, I, he should have caught that. I mean, that was $1.1 million over 10 years in a much smaller scale, of course, than what we're talking about. But sure. You know, in my head, he should have said, hmm, something seems off. And it's, it, it isn't until most of the time, it isn't until somebody says, hmm, something seems weird. In fact, that's right. Yeah. Let's talk about that heads up that Sterling next door gave them. Wasn't that interesting? Yeah. I was surprised that they didn't even go anywhere with that. But again, they trusted her and they thought that she was taking care of all of that. Yeah, but tell us, tell them what, the, tell them what we mean, what we're, we said Sterling. So Sterling was a neighboring city that they were, they were doing well. Their city was, I mean, it wasn't, they weren't in debt. They were getting approximately, they were approximately the same population. They were getting the same, close to the same amount of money as Dixon, but they were doing fine and Dixon wasn't. So they had brought that to Dixon. I don't remember the, the, they actually sent him a letter. Yeah. I, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I don't remember exactly how that came to be that they brought that to their attention, but. And, and it, that was a few years before the bank account was discovered. Right. And there were times, you know, just like the fruitcake embezzlement, there were times that somebody said, you know, something's really off and oh my gosh, how come we don't have the money, you know, and what's happening here. But, you know, they had an audit company, you uh -huh. know, it was doing annual audits and gosh, they were, they, the audit company was actually there every day picking up reports, you know, so why, why wouldn't they see it? Well, and how often do you hear that in a dental office that, you know, I don't know why we're not making any money. We're working so hard. We're seeing so many patients. We should be making money and having money in the bank. And there's, you know, that's, that's what I hear all the time. It's like, then they figure out that that money's not going in their bank account. It's going in someone else's, right? <laughs> or a seventh secret account. <laughs> Yeah, the seven secrets. <laughs> yeah, I just, well, and so she did it for 20 years. You know, yeah. in 2013, she pled guilty to wire fraud and money laundering, and she was sentenced to 235 months. What I thought was interesting is, I would love to see this in my cases, um, she got the maximum sentence, which is, I got to say, I mean, of course you expect, her and Bernie, you know, are probably in similar cells, right. um, you know, for his stealing. But right. the, uh, what her sentence was, she got plus restitution of the, let me repeat that, of the $53,740,394. And the judge imposed a forfeiture judgment of the same amount. So now she owes a hundred and seven million four hundred and eighty thousand seven hundred eighty eight dollars. Isn't that interesting? Which she's you know never going to pay. Never that. Gonna be. Yeah, they said it would take like one hundred and twenty 
years to do to, <laughs> to pay the restitution. She's not going to pay that back. No. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you saw this, but she petitioned for a compassionate release last year because of COVID-19. Oh, no, uh, I did not. Yeah, yeah she, wow. she's 68 years old. She's just a few years older than me. Wow. Um, she's made some really horrible choices. <laughs> but, yeah, she sure has. But she's now scheduled uh, for October 20th, two, two, 2029 uh, release. She'll be 76 years old. She's still got eight and a half years or eight yeah. over eight years. Yeah. Yep. So, oh, no. you know, a lot of people in the town asked where she got the money. That always seems to come up. You know, my 1.1 million, they asked that question too. And she'd tell them, you know, she won the lottery, you know, not one, yeah. not twice, but three <laughs> times. <laughs> well, and that's, I, you know, I don't know if people just thought it was from Rita breeding the horses that she was making a ton of money from that, but wow she had she had a very luxurious lifestyle holy moly yeah <laughs> so i have two pages of those notes <laughs> oh my gosh she had 400 horses on 22 farms in 13 states isn't that amazing talk about asset management trying to, to reclaim all of that to sell and they sold them all at auctions um, one horse sold for seven hundred seventy-five thousand. I just won one horse, a championship horse. Of Can course. you imagine? Yeah, she and these weren't just horses; these were championship horses. Right, and then yeah. she was breeding them too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they even <laughs> sold sperm at yeah. auctions. Yeah, for like championships horses. It was for like $95,000 they sold it. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It was a lot. I didn't write that down, but I was just like, oh my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's a really powerful, potent stuff there for 95 grand. Right, right. So the other thing was she had a motor coach. Oh, she was yeah. on when she started stealing at 99000 Then she upgraded to another one for 400000 Mm -hmm. Then she upgraded that one to 1.7 million. And then she upgraded another one to 1.8 million. And then she got the 2.1 million Prevost Liberty Coach RV with slide outs, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, all wood, king sized bed, five TVs, leather couch, and much more. It was I unreal. <laughs> and if you can afford that, then you're going to hire a driver. Oh, sure. Sure. I'd say, Why well, would you drive it yourself? Yeah, no kidding. Right. <laughs> I think she got a vintage Corvette for her boyfriend. Uh huh. She had a cowboy boot collection. She had spa trips. She had the speedboat. She had a baby grand piano. Well, you've got a baby grand piano, so I guess that's nice. I do. It was handed down to me, though. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I didn't buy but, it for you. But do you have a tanning bed? I do not. Oh, I see, she had that. a tanning bed. She yeah. had trucks. Now, let me. When I say she had trucks, they weren't just Chevy trucks. They. <laughs> she had eighteen wheelers. Yes, she did. <laughs> cool luxury horse trailers. Do you know uh -huh. that that one horse trailer was one horse trailer that was worth more than so many houses at $259,000? Right. Yep. She had, okay, at auction, fake horse tails. Ew, I didn't see that. Yeah, so Teresa Duncan would want to know if that was going to make the horse hair beds. All right. But, and I actually was looking, Teresa, in case you're listening, I was looking to see if there was going to be any horse hair beds out of all of this. And I, she w she might have been tempted, but I did not see if that was there. She did have $6,800 custom leather saddle. Yeah. Two ranches in Dixon and one out of state. 88-acre ranch. Uh, and this was interesting. The 88-acre ranch was bought uh, from her brother in 2011 for 270000 but then it was auctioned 
to her nephew for one point one uh one million one hundred thirty four thousand three hundred seventy five dollars in two thousand and thirteen. Wow, he got the. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering. I looked it up on Zillow yesterday, <laughs> just because yeah. I was curious. Yeah. It's only listed at two hundred eighty-five thousand seven hundred sixty-nine dollars. I hope he got a lot more out of it than that because he I got the so. end of the deal. I hope he got some equipment and stuff like that with it or something. Well, that's kind of what I was wondering, but it looked like they sold the equipment separate. Uh, that's what I thought from what I was seeing um, in the articles and on that YouTube video. That yeah. uh, all, all the Queen's horses. That was, a, that was an interesting documentary. Yeah, I, in fact, I will leave uh, the link on that in the show, show notes uh, so that you can watch it. All the Queen's Horses. It was really interesting. It was. It was. Uh, yeah. Uh, apparently, her nephew uses um, the land now for show cattle. We've gone from horses to show cattle. Wow. Interesting. So she had two homes in Dixon. Not one home, but she had two right. homes. And then she had, a, she had a Florida condo. Well, she had a Florida house too, didn't she? Yeah. Well, it was a condo. Oh, I thought that it was a house. Gotcha. For 260000 Yeah. I just, she had jewelry. Uh -huh. Let's talk about the jewelry. <laughs> My goodness. Janice and I were not fans. <laughs> um, she... In fact, on her personal American Express card, they said that she had charged 339000 on jewelry alone. And when I looked at some of the pictures of her jewelry, I went, why? <laughs> she liked it gaudy. <laughs> yeah, she really did like it gaudy. There was um, probably 30 pieces of jewelry that I saw. Watches, jewelry, rings, necklaces, bracelets. Um, there might have only been two rings that I saw that I liked. Mm -hmm. The rest of them were frightening. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, I agree. But um, Very interesting. Yeah, I actually even uh, on the website when I was doing all the research, there's a uh, FBI did a tour of her home. I watched that too. Did you see that? Uh-huh. Cool bathroom. Yes, it was. Nice big tub. <laughs> uh-huh. Nice shower. The the um block uh the glass blocks, you know, that went around the shower. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very nice. It was nice. The uh showroom, the uh, award room though was a little on the gaudy side as well. well Whatever well, that the showroom, I think, or the she had all the trophies and everything, ribbons, it everything was for twenty years stored there. Yeah. Um. So I looked up one of the custom homes on Zillow too. <laughs> Are you looking to move to Dixon? <laughs> Actually, I looked up the property taxes too. But, <laughs> um. It was listed for two hundred sixty-three thousand four hundred seventy-one. Wow. I don't know what it sold for. I didn't look that part up. Interesting. But some of the horses' names, I'm Money To, She Scores, Pack of Jewels, Me, Myself, and I, Jewelry by Tiffany. Okay, I just have to tell you, the stuff she bought was not Tiffany. <laughs> no, definitely not. Yeah, one Me, of myself and I, I find that name very interesting because that is definitely who she was thinking about, wasn't it? Oh, it was, wasn't it? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. It was very interesting. So, when it was all said and done, the city's not going to get any money from her. Right. She's in jail. So they decided to to file lawsuits. Um, rightfully so, by the way, they filed a lawsuit against the bank, right? And they filed a lawsuit um, against the primary auditing company that did most of the accounting and auditing. Then they also filed um, a lawsuit against another auditing company 
that when the primary auditing company decided there might be a conflict of interest, maybe too little too late, right? Um, this, this third company, the second company, uh, did that work for seven years. And so um, the primary uh, auditing company settled the lawsuit for $35.15 million which I thought was pretty fair. Right. They got all the fees back that they paid. Right. Um, and so, and, and to that end, I want to say that too, because um, they had, they paid these companies money for services that were rendered, but not rendered as they should have been. And so they might've done the work, but they did not do the work. Right. Yeah, they didn't do it to the extent that they needed to, for sure. Right. And they got a million dollars from that other auditing company that did the work for only seven years of the 20. But then they got $3.85 million from Fifth Third. Which, and that's something that I'd like to say, is that's one of the things that I find in, in the offices that we work with, is there's a lot of... Um, trust put into the bank that the bank is going to be watching things for you and stuff like that. And I don't, I don't think that they're watching. They're not finding the fraud as much as you think they will, you know, of course they do find fraud and, you know, you get those alerts on your phone and that kind of thing, but there is, you know, this whole nother bank account was made and there were, there was lots of money being transferred over there that, there was never a question and she was doing it by writing checks to treasurer and just putting it in that account. So, it, you know, for hundreds of thousands of dollars, you would think that there might be a, a red flag that went up every once in a while at the bank. Right. So my 1.1 million, um, it was probably the most interesting case, which I've had to date. Um, she actually deposited insurance checks at in her personal, actually her husband's personal bank account mm -hmm. by doing it through the drive through That's what bank. I I had a case that she was doing it through the ATM. And they're like, well, she did it through the ATM. I said, so why aren't you checking the checks that are coming through the ATM? So it scares me a little bit too, you know, how much we were doing electronic deposits and that stuff with our phones and with the machines, that's all great. But I, I think as business owners, we all need to be keeping an eye on our bank accounts and making sure that all of that money is, is going in and well, scary. they can't watch it all. So, and I'd also like to say too, that you can sue a bank. Right. Right. Um, yeah. It should have been done in the 1.1 million, but it wasn't. The case I had, they did. Yeah, and they yeah. recovered. Well, not not anything close to what they lost, but they they recovered some, about 20 percent oh. maybe. So yeah, it would have been good. Yeah, the um, uh, my guy got really bad advice and said that they never win, and that's so not true. Right. That is so not true. But anyways, um, but just to let our listeners know, you can sue if there is a responsibility of neglect and it's obvious. Um, so that that is something that they should see. But so they sold everything and they recovered about 50 million in the auctions. I don't know how much they got off her jewelry. I really wanted to know that, but. <laughs> I was happy that they were able to recover money and I saw yeah. that they, you know like they cleaned up the riverfront and made a park there on the riverfront with some of those recovered funds and were able to to take care of the city yeah so 10 million went to attorney's fees yeah yowza 20 million went to pay off all the debt left by Crundwell. And so that's probably the loans that, that had to be taken out 
uh, right. 2008, 9, and 10, probably. Yep. yep. So, and the rest was put into a recovery fund for special projects and emergencies like you talked about on the riverfront. Right. And, and the roads and hiring people again because they had laid off a number of people. Right. Um, you know, changing the city system, which is one of the things that they did. They uh, went to a managerial um, city setup, which is what we have in Arlington with a city manager. But um, I just, I'm amazed that things like this happen without people, other people questioning much sooner. I mean, right. she, over 20 years, Janice, she was completely comfortable. Oh, yeah. Well, she was taking vacations. You know, a lot of times we say that embezzlers don't want to take time off because they don't want their fraud to be discovered. Well, she had total confidence. She was taking all kinds of time off. It didn't bother her at all. Yeah, but they did say that when she took time off that they had somebody else go to the post office box and, and get the, get the mail. Yeah. But yeah. keep it for her, not open it. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. It was really interesting. Completely trusted. Absolutely. There's that big word that we hear all the time. I know. And, you know, I found it interesting that Ronald Reagan is from that town and one of his quotes that I like is trust, but verify. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. wow. I use that one too. Yeah. So, and then here they were trust and not verifying. Yeah. So let's talk about how this does relate to dentistry. Cause there are so many different, you know, I don't want to ever talk about, uh, which I've done probably more today talking about specifics of embezzlement, dental embezzlement, um, than I ever do. But to talk about um, other cases that have obviously hit the headlines and things that are already in the headlines, then those things are known, right? And so that's why Janice and I are comfortable talking about those, right? This perspective. But there are some obvious um, things that do relate to dentistry. Yeah, well, a lot of it is the trusting, you know, I mean, every office that I have ever been into, there's a lot of trust given to one or two people at the front. And, um, you know, we have to have segregation of duties, we have to split those things up. No matter if it's, if you only have one person at your front desk, I understand that, but then don't have that person taking the deposits to the bank. And, uh, balancing the the bank account with your computer QuickBooks. software yeah, and your QuickBooks and all of that. So that if, if you only have one person at the front desk, then the dentist or the dental spouse or somebody else needs to be doing that so that we have that segregation of duties. That's yeah, so this sounds familiar. Rita picked up the mail. She made the deposits. She entered the transactions. Right. She signed the check. She moved money. Yeah, she did it all. Everything that we hear sometimes in dentistry, to which I tell the doctors when they call me, uh, yeah, so, I mean, even the CPAs, I'll tell you, I don't recommend they're the ones that do that. Right. That would not be within that scope of work that needs to happen. And so, and, and seriously, QuickBooks is so stinking easy. It's 15% <laughs> of the whole accounting software because 85% is the practice software. Right. And QuickBooks is just a really small bit and much easier to use than any practice software out there. Right. And now you can download, you can do everything and it takes like an hour, two hours a week. That's it. Right. It's so easy. It is. And so, that's one way that the dentist can do it. He is the business owner. I try to tell him that right. you are the business owner. Yeah. So managing your own business is really the most effective tool to overseeing. And there's some ways to do that. But um, when there's no oversight, yeah, Janice, then, then Janice and I get the phone call. 
That's right. And no protocols in place too. I think that's something that, you know, you need to have these systems in place. That was something that I heard on that um, YouTube video, that documentary was there were no policies in place and, and no oversight. And had that happened, it could have been, it, even if she had done it, it could have been caught a lot sooner if they had those things in place. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I thought was interesting is, um, I mean, I've had a case where, um, let's see, how do I say that without, <laughs> that not all the patient revenue was going into the practice's bank account. Right. That it had been redirected to the office managers or whoever's front desk workers, uh, front desk employees, uh, bank accounts. And so I'm surprised. I actually, I'm not surprised anymore, but it's always okay. sad when I get a phone call from the doctor and they don't have any idea who the merchant card service company is. Right. You know, what the logins are for anything. Um, and sometimes when the last deposits were made or if all the money's going into the same bank account. Right. I have one account. That was a phone call I had the other day. I just have one account. And that's, that's what I think, you know, I mean, that's how, that's pretty much how this one was discovered, right? Was just by somebody right. calling and, and getting the accounts all, they're all in your name. You know, you really need to be the one watching the mail and uh, ideally you get the mail, you give them the, the checks and that, that they need take the checks off of the EOB if you need to. You know, I've got offices that make a copy of the EOB with the check on it because it is easier to enter that into the system that way. But, you know, take that and then you can take it to the bank. Yeah, I tell them to, to um, get a post office box close to their house. Yeah. Then they can stop on the way to the practice and pick up the mail. And then right. they can keep a letter opener in the car and they open it because if they open it and it, and it's seen that it's been opening, then the front office people assume that the mail has been gone through. Right. Exactly. So, um, that's a really, you don't see that uh, Delta dental check that entered into the system that was $1,200, then where is it? You know, and asking questions. I think a lot of the problem with this is that the people, that were in charge didn't even necessarily know the right questions to ask right you know that was one of the problems was if they had a question they asked rita and she was able to come up with an answer for them that happens right. a lot in the dental office too and so all the time you really need to know your business and know the questions to ask and that's something that you know whenever i'm done, you know, doing an investigation or in the consulting offices we work with, I teach them just, here's a few questions to ask just to let them know you're list you're watching. Yeah. Questions. Well, and sometimes it's, um, that you imply you're doing something, not that exactly. you're necessarily doing it. Exactly. That you imply. Yeah. I'm, I'm always amazed though, that they may not know their finances. You know, if the CPA is doing it and, and the CPAs are, bless their hearts, I got to tell you, this last year has not been easy on them. No. <laughs> trying to keep up with all the changes in taxes and all sorts of stuff. Oh, my gosh. Right. And so, you know, if they are, if they're relying on the CPA to do all their accounting, they may or may, may not be getting statements every month. Right. And so if they're not getting statements every month, it's really hard to oversee their practice. And again, remember that the CPA's job is not to detect fraud. And so right. it's really the business owner's job to manage and to oversee. And that's just it. The, you know, the, the CPAs sometimes will bring that to your attention if they, if they catch it, but it isn't what they're, what they're really paid to be doing, but it's nice if they can catch it, but they're not yeah, always. You and I both know 
99.9% of them have no clue about practice software. And so they're only seeing what's being put into QuickBooks. So they only see what's being put into the bank. Right. They don't see the practice software reports. And a lot of times, even if they get the practice software reports, they're asking the person at the front desk to give them, to create the reports exactly. for them and give them to them. So they're not, they may not be getting an accurate look at that anyway, right? You know, They could be potentially asking the embezzler to create the reports so that they can be reviewed, right? Right, right. And that's part of the problem, you know? So, and that's every CPA that I talk to, they're like, we they they found it easier to find it especially the older ones that i talked to when it was ledger you know when you had the pegboard and the ledgers that they're like i could find it easier then than when we had you know when the software came out and so they don't know and they can't know all of the different softwares because they don't know dentistry so much and right. what's going on with with all of that so yeah that's a really cool thing about the design of QuickBooks and using what I created as the practice management chart of accounts, mm -hmm. because, you know, the city had to make layoffs and make cuts to services all the while she was robbing them blind. Right. right. So if they had been using something like, let's just transpose it then to the dental. So you took in this much money, but then you start seeing how she did that. You would see those percentages of income being exorbitantly high. Just right. like they see when, when people pad their payrolls, your pay, their payroll goes from 26% to 36%, then they're going, hmm, something's off. Right. But if the, if the design of the chart of accounts is not so for business management purposes, but just tax accounting, they're probably not ever going to catch that right. because it's not created in such a way that they'd be able to easily do that anyway. Um, yeah, when you think about your CPAs, you know, what I say all the time is their, their job is to save you money on your taxes and, you know, try and, and come up, they, they look at all the laws that uh, they need to for the taxes and all of that, but they're not looking at all the time. Some of them are, but they're not always looking at the health of your business and where you can get better or where things have gotten worse. That's not what they're looking at. So you and I always talk about the victims of fraud mm -hmm. and it's not just the practice owners. No, it's not. Unfortunately. Yeah. It's, um, I, did you see that the mayor passed away from cancer three years after she was sentenced? Isn't that sad? And yeah. that Kathy resigned three years after she was sentenced too. Yeah. Kathy resigned same year the mayor died. Yeah. So if you see, if, if, if you watch that, that documentary, it really took its toll on both of them. You could see, um, how hard it was for, for both of them. And I'm sure for a lot of other people that worked in that office. And that's what I say all the time is it's, it's hard on, on the employees that are in the, in the office. I mean, one thing is that they trusted that person. Probably they were their friend. I mean, you become friends with the people that you work with. So it's hard. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, Bernie Madoff is another good example of that because um, Bernie Madoff's son uh, died from cancer. The other son committed suicide. So many right. victims of Bernie Madoff committed suicide, died from illnesses later. Um, so. You know, it's just, that's a fallout. The stress is unbelievable when you're having to deal with stuff like that. And so I just, I mean, so I think it's interesting that I was going to kind of to jump back for that for a sec. Sterling, uh, Illinois tried to tell them in that letter, oh, right. trying to give them the heads up. Well, you know, Harry Mercopolis tried to warn the SEC for 10 years. Right. About burning off. Yeah. So I, the other thing that I'd say is if somebody's trying to tell you that something's not right, or if your gut is telling you that something's not right, maybe you need to pay attention because one of the things that we saw is she only ramped up her stealing because she was completely comfortable. I've never, 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 never had an embezzler slow down their stealing. I know. <laughs> they always ramp it up. Yeah. yeah. Now they might, they might slow down. I just had one. 
they might slow down if um, you change systems and they they're trying to figure out how to cover their tracks in the new system. Sure. Um, if they change locations, they're trying to get settled in the new location, but they'll pick it up. Don't worry. They haven't gone anywhere. And that little taste of greed in their mouth never goes away. Right. And if you're getting a lot of pushback from somebody because you've implemented a new system, you want to pay attention to that too. Oh, why, yeah. is there, why is there so much pushback? You know, uh, definitely an area to watch because they don't want to have a new system when they've already got one figured out. <laughs> you know, I, I've been on, I've, I've been pretty uh, deeply entwined with my hometown here. Um, not embezzling. Just <laughs> thank you. I'm glad to that. <laughs> clarify that on lots of different uh, committees and such. And one of the things that has impressed me is the outside audits that they have done. Every every single entity has a, an outside audit within that. That's the managerial city setup. Um, in that they they go in and they audit and they look with a fine tooth comb. I've even argued. I was on an executive committee for the convention bureau, convention city uh, tourism, I don't know, whatever it is, <laughs> MOUSC, anyways, um, and argued with them on a couple of different points on the pickiness, but appreciate, you know, as a, as a certified embezzlement um, person, I just, I appreciated the pickiness of the That's detail good. they went to, yeah. And don't feel like Dixon got that same. That was one of the things I kept thinking of because I've gone through those auditing um, reviews mm -hmm. and it's a big, huge, fat, hairy deal. Yeah. And just don't feel like Dixon got their money's worth, obviously. They sure didn't. Obviously. So important to have someone outside entity review your information. I'm right. always surprised that dentistry doesn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it would be so beneficial if just everyone would have just even a yearly audit, you know, that would maybe be able to tell you, raise some red flags. Watch these areas. Yeah. I, we have to be careful calling it an audit because neither you or I are CPAs. No. But um, I call it financial analysis mm -hmm. review. Um, and we, we can do that because we know both systems. Right. So we look at the whole part of the uh, system and do the review of other finances that way. But um, I just, I think it's so important. Obviously it would have caught if somebody had really looked at from outside within. It's one of the reasons I get all the bank statements and I mean, I get everything I have. Sure fork over everything so that I can review everything. Right. And um, I just think that's really important. It would have saved a lot of money. Right. Well, here, if they would have been doing that, if they would have looked, even if it took a couple of years, she would have only gotten maybe a million dollars instead of 53 million, you know? Yeah, no kidding. Um, so Gary Shapiro with the North District of Illinois United States Attorney's Office praised the FBI's who conducted the investigation and the U.S. Marshals Service for its efficient management of the seized assets. And I quote, we have used criminal and civil forfeiture proceedings to ensure the recovery of as much money as possible for the city of Dixon and its taxpayers, he said. Unfortunately, this case serves as a painful lesson that trust without verification can lead to betrayal. I thought that was it. Yep. So, and Corey Nelson, let me give you another one. The special agent in charge of the Chicago office of the FBI said the law is clear. Those who hold positions of trust must not abuse that trust. We remain committed to holding anyone using an official position for personal gain, as Rita Crundwell did for years, fully accountable for their corrupt actions. So, 
you know, I feel like, boy, did they investigate. They were probably um, sal salivating. Oh, my goodness. For everything that they found. So much that they found. Anything else that you can think of that we need to tell our listeners? I don't think so. Nothing that I can think of. We talked about the trust and the segregation of duties, and I think we covered it all. And you know what, Janice? We say this every time when we talk about embezzlement in a podcast. And yet some people out there are going, oh, you know, that was Dixon, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to steal $53 million from me. It's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, somebody stole 53 million from you. You'd know it, right? Right. <laughs> but, you know, when the average dental embezzlement case is about 100,000 now, um, I'd say to catch it a little bit sooner would be a good deal. Absolutely. So, yeah, it can happen. And like what we said, it's not going to go away. No. And in these times right now, it's... You I wouldn't be surprised if it's happening more, unfortunately. Yeah, well, if you didn't listen to the one of the podcasts I talked about, Lies, uh, be, Begat Lies, I think is what I said, something like that. Um, you should listen to that. All the SBA, IDLE, and PPP fraud right. that's just in the short amount of time that that funding has actually been available. It's yeah. amazing. In fact, I talked to my banker about that a little bit yesterday about some of the, she had listened to the podcast. She was like, oh my gosh, I hear about this all the time. Uh -huh. So uh, it's interesting what they hear on their side. And, and in response to that, how the SB, SBA is tightening down um, verification and requiring so much more verification in administering those funds. So that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Well, Janice, this has been amazing, of course, as always. It was great. Thank you for asking me to do this one with you. I It was very intriguing, for sure. Well, I have a feeling that you and I will be presenting another one. We yeah. have to come up with another doozy. But, um, I, you know, the reality of this is, in closing, um, there are three types of listeners. I, I thought about this the, the other day, three types of listeners. There's business owners, uh, dental practice owners. And those are our clients that we, we talk to all the time. And then there's employees. And, and hopefully the business owners get the meat of what we're trying to convey, that they need to pay attention. And then there's the employees who, like Kathy, if they see something, they can say something. Right. You know, but you have to be the kind of business owner that um, is approachable so that your employee can come up and say something. Then, you know what? I'm almost certain there's probably also the third, which would be an embezzler. Probably. And so I'll tell you what I tell the office managers that I train. If you steal from your doctor... I will hunt you down and I will prosecute you. I, yeah, Jenna says, you don't want that. Trust me. <laughs> I, you know, and I have office managers that laugh about that all the time when I say that, but I mean it. I am so protective of my docs. You are too. I am. Yes. You know, they are our families and That's our right. friends. And so I don't, you know, everything I do, everything you do, Janice, always in the back of our heads is trying to protect their practice, help them succeed as a business owner, but to help protect it from being embezzled. Right. And so if you are an embezzler and you're listening to this, you will find out. I mean, you'll get found out. Trust me. There will be an end of your embezzlement. You'll get found out and you'll lose everything and you'll lose whatever prestige you think you've gained. It won't be worth it. Um, no one ever comes out of it and go, yeah, that was cool. You know, I'm pretty sure 
Kathy is looking at 76 when she's going to get out and go, oh my gosh. Um, I mean, I just, I feel bad for her in, in some way that she made such a horrible choice for her life. Right. And that she could have been the person known for helping the city, but now she's known as the person that ruined the city. That's right. So um, just to let you know, it won't last if you're the embezzler listening. Yeah. And I promise you that Janice and I will bring you another in the embezzlement news. I haven't asked her yet, by the way, but <laughs> I'm just telling her. She's Anyone my friend. I can tell that, right? No, she <laughs> loves doing it, so I wouldn't even ask. We'll come up with another doozy in about six weeks of in the embezzlement news uh, to bring you something else. And so until then, I just want to tell everybody to be safe and determine that you're going to lead with integrity this week. Well, and for the rest of your life. <laughs> Take care. Y'all have a great time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. That's a wrap for this podcast of Money In, Money Out. Thanks for listening. Be sure to write down the most valuable tip you learned today so you don't forget it. And remember, you can find out more about all the valuable books and services Susan has to offer at www.susangunsolutions.com. 